Today in the podcast, we have Stephen Kohler, who is the founder and CEO of Adira Labs. And he's got this really cool business management practice where he's actually brought his music skills into the program. And it's an amazing story of how actually the non-musicians were the ones who really got it. And maybe it's just like being new to the situation or something. It's a really great story. He's got lots of other cool stuff to talk about. So let's jump right in. All right, Stephen Kohler, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on this morning. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. So Stephen, you are the CEO and founder of Adira, and you have a lot of cool things going on. And one of the reasons I think we got connected originally is because uh, there are only so many guitarist guys who who do business things and they naturally find each other. And then I get on a Zoom with you and your equipment back wall is so much cooler than mine. Uh, <laughs> so I had to have you on and have a conversation. So I'm, I'm uh, curious, maybe give us uh, just a quick uh, kind of your day job, what do you do? And then um, let's talk about how you got into music and what your origin story might be. Absolutely. Again, Michael, thank you so much for for having me on. And it's, it's a pleasure to connect. I'm glad the universe brought us together. Yeah. Um, so my day job is, uh, as you mentioned, I'm founder and CEO of uh, a boutique leadership development firm called Audier Labs. Um, in short, we uh, enable leaders, teams, and organizations to, as we like to say, amplify their leadership. We do that really in two ways. We do one-on-one -on -one executive coaching and then team development with a bit of a twist. And we and um, uh, the twist is that we like to use music as a lens for leadership development and growth. And I can tell you all about that. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what I'm not doing when I'm uh, at the day job, I'm obviously a, uh, have a wonderful family that I can tell you more about. But musically, I'm a lifelong musician. Started on trumpet in 1987-ish, uh, then later discovered, like so many of us, the world of electric guitar and uh, and never turned around. And, and now I'm a singer-songwriter slash guitar player, and I, I just put out a, a, a new album. So uh, that's a quick snapshot. That's great. It's obviously uh, a lot going on. So honestly, I, I am um, I'm really curious to hear how you use that music lens in your coaching and leadership stuff. Can we talk about that a little bit? That's really a, a cool, interesting take. And and talk a little bit about like do your uh, your what happens when a company like isn't familiar with that that metaphor and they're not musicians. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll provide a little context in terms of how yeah. I kind of found my way into that. So. Um, I have a long career, like many of us do, in, in corporate uh, America. I spent about 25 years doing sales and marketing roles. Um, <clears throat> about four and a half years ago, when I was starting Audira, I realized that I had a real passion on the people side of business. Um, mm -hmm. I became an executive coach, started Audira, and at, around that time, my wife kind of hit me over the head and said, hey, dummy, why haven't you found a way to integrate your music somehow into this whole thing? Sure. And I said, oh my God, Shelly, that's brilliant. And so what I started to do is really a, a, a long kind of experimentation or in music we might call it improvisation process where I started to, into the coaching sessions and team development sessions with companies, started to bring what I thought were some very natural analogs um, or metaphors between uh, the world of music that you certainly know, Michael, and what I also knew about corporate leadership. Um, everything from um, thinking about how to, you know, one of, one of Audir's uh, biggest areas of focus in helping leaders is to learn how to truly listen. And so bringing things like ear training and other kind of foundational musical concepts mm. into the world of corporate leadership to help them become more effective leaders. We're big also on what we'll call compositional leadership, where we help leaders and teams think about much like creating a score or a composition. Mm. What do they want their strategic vision to look like in one year, three years, five years, much like creating a score? And then as a conductor, if you will, how okay. do they want to help work with a team to bring that forth? Um, so there, anyway, we started to experiment with a lot of those metaphors. And what we learned, interestingly, Michael, was I had a hypothesis that musicians would totally get it. I didn't know if non-musicians would get it. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, it was almost the reverse. Musicians thought it was interesting, but the, the non-musicians, particularly in corporate audiences, really found it powerful, engaging, really? and fun. Okay. That's really cool because it's funny that that would be like if you'd asked me like which which group would do better, I would have been 100% 80 or you know, 180 degrees wrong on that. That's really, uh, really cool. I, I wonder if, um, you know, is, is it something where people are so excited by this cool metaphor and being able to interact in a new way? Like what do you what do you what do you think you could attribute it to? Um, if I step back, um, one of the things that, that we hear a lot is that corporate leaders, obviously, and, and I count myself as is once uh, who experienced this 
have all done a lot of leadership development in some mm -hmm. form. And and the downside of a lot of that is it to be very blunt, Michael, it's quite boring and dry. Yeah, sure. And it's not it's not sticky. It doesn't stay with you. And so the interest that we're hearing on the music side for Adira is that number one, it's unique. It's mm -hmm. not something that they've heard necessarily uh, be brought together, music and leadership. Okay. Number two is it's our approach is very experiential, meaning we're not, yeah. we're not putting people to sleep with PowerPoint slides in a in a warm conference room somewhere. It's they're on their feet. They're using musical instruments. They're using musical exercises. There's no musical training needed. Um, yeah. And then the third part is it's sticky. It's something that they they can use three, six months, a year later. And, mm -hmm. and people are really um, excited about that. That's, you know, I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your, uh, you said you mentioned that your training is kind of part of it. And I know for me, I think about uh, when we do, when we do even kind of internal leadership training, a lot of what we talk about is being able to listen and sort of be there in the moment uh, and, and have kind of, you know, hear what other people are doing and then react in real time uh, is really important. It's really easy to sort of just give a one way presentation, but to be able to hear and, and be more interactive is really powerful. Tell me about what your training kind of methodology is like and how you use it. Yeah, I love the question. Um, we start with the premise that that the world is incredibly noisy and cacophonous, mm -hmm. right? We have, I read somewhere that we have something like uh, upwards of nine channels of digital communication hitting us at any mm -hmm. one time, texts and yeah. emails and Slack and all that. And the impact on that from a leadership perspective is that we can be very unfocused, unpresent, and very distracted. And it can hold us back as leaders and so from a, from a listening and an ear training perspective, what we help leaders do, much like you said, is to become very present in kind of three areas. Mm -hmm. Number one, listen to themselves. And by that, we mean really getting clear on their values, their mission, their purpose, from a leadership perspective, how they want to show up. Maybe things that they're doing well that they want to continue and maybe things that they want to let go of. The second area of listening is really starting to tune in uh, to those colleagues or constituents around them that, let's be honest, most of us are not really present to. In yeah. most conversations, a lot of us do what's called uh, listening with the intent to respond, meaning we right. nod our head, we give some ahas, yeah. but we're not really present. We're just cueing, getting ready to, to tell the other person what we think yeah. um, or perhaps try to convince them, but we're yeah. not really there. And so we learn, we, we show them how to get really present with the other individual being um, as the Buddhists say, kind of uh, uh, a curious, beginner's mm -hmm. mind. And the third mode of listening is what we call kind of listening to the audience, listening to the space. Um, and, and the idea is that, as any good musician would tell you, is it starts with kind of reading the audience and recognizing what they need and then yeah. adapting how we show up as leaders. So that's a bit of a frame in terms of uh, that, that area of focus. That's really good. You know, it's funny, as you were saying that, one of the things that occurs to me about... Um... Uh, why it might be really successful for non-musicians is that they're in an area of sort of thought and expertise that they are almost by def they're by definition a, a beginner to. And so it's new and they were able to get to that place quickly, whereas maybe musicians sort of, oh, I already sort of get this. This is sort of my world. And so there may be a little bit more closed off. Um, that's really interesting because one thing, the other thing I was thinking about that you said about your wife, I also had a similar thing where um, I've been you know, a musician my whole life and I had really deliberately drawn a deep line in the sand where the two shall never mix. And uh, mostly because I think I brought a lot of baggage that I thought people had about musicians that they were, you know, whatever the, you know, the stereotype would be. And that's not professional. And uh and then all of a sudden, like like maybe your experience, every single time I brought it up, it was you know welcomed with open arms and really people excited about it. So I'm curious for you, were you were you, were you keeping it apart separately? And you just needed a nudge from your wife, or tell me about that experience. Uh, very similar, Michael. I think in my own mind, I had this kind of uh, demarcation line between what I thought uh, was the quote creative world and then the corporate world. Yeah. And you know, like so many of us, I kind of compartmentalized those worlds. And what mm -hmm. I started to realize uh, is is much like what I think you referenced where it was almost the opposite. There was a hunger. There was a passion from the corporate audience to to bring more of that um, those traits or skills or practices and principles that we learn as musicians into that environment. The idea yeah. of collaboration, true collaboration. Um, one of the things that we do uh, in our workshops is leveraging you know, principles of, let's say, improvisation. And we talk about, you know, leading like a jazz pro. Um, mm -hmm. It's very much this idea of 
how to to partner and build on what uh, your your partner is doing. So we'll do this concept you certainly know, Michael, as a musician called call and response, mm -hmm. where one partner will say something and you're super present and then you build on that. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of little things that people are really responding well to. Well, that's really cool. Because um, that, that goes along, you were talking earlier about that, you know, you were this this whole model was an experiment, but I think that itself the implementation is teaching people to be able to experiment. And I'm trying not to say jam because it's kind of corny, but like <laughs> it's that that experience uh, that call and response is probably a better way to, to describe that. That you're really when you're doing it well, you're listening and engaging. Um, and it's funny when you were talking about uh, um, you know what listening is. Uh, my uncle when I was a kid joked that he was a lawyer. And he said that uh, that listening was waiting to speak, mm. and like that was definitely like his point of view, and like a little bit, you know, um, maybe facetiously, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that's sort of how the, some people operate, um, and that's not effective. Yeah, actually, Miles Miles Davis has a number of riffs on this, as you know, and he, he yeah. you know, what, one of the ones that I love is he said, you know, uh, essentially, music is is much more about the space in between the notes. Yeah. And the rests, if you will, rather than the notes themselves. And I think that speaks to, to the importance of pausing, listening and, and really the importance of silence. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really cool. Uh, it's funny. Uh, um, Miles Davis has come up in approximately 50% of the conversations I've had about this. Cause it really, oh, yeah. a lot of those famous quotes, I think come from that, from him in that era. Um, I'm curious, maybe on a different track, um, uh, thinking about kind of what got you up to this point. Uh, I know a lot of people I've talked to have ideas about what either the practice of music, performance of music, or even the thinking of it brought to how they approach business and kind of what they think they learned from that. Is that, is that a topic that resonates with you or you have any kind of insight to? Oh, very much. And I'll, I'll share a funny story that, that you or your listeners might be able to relate to. And this was really the context is about my own self-awareness. Um, being a musician, you know, I coming out of college, I was looking for... <clears throat> A day job where ideally I would not only be able to pay the rent, but it would be something that I would get um, some level of passion for. And I, I, I had the privilege of working for an audio company many of your listeners may know called Sure. Hmm. Um, I found my way into a new product development role. And one day I was talking to, I think, an executive coach. And I, I just said, well, I've kind of got these two worlds. I've got my music role where I can be super creative. <laughs> and then yeah. I have my day job where I make new products. And and she kind of smiled and she said, do you see a connection there? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, like, are you hearing yourself? <laughs> yeah. You're like, you know, new product development is pretty creative, right? Do you yeah. see a link there? And it, it was pretty right. hilarious. So I guess the reason I mentioned that is that I was, uh, throughout my journey, there were, there were parts where I may not have realized some of the things that I got from music or music is certainly enabled in terms of creativity, communication, um, listening, working together to build something great, um, you know, delivering for an audience. There were a lot of those kind of parallels that, that were almost unconscious uh, that I didn't even realize it was bringing into the day job. Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, for me, a lot of it is, um, you know, some people get trained, you know, about how to give a speech or, you know, trained how to you know, listen all those in other contexts. And for me, it's, you know, to have, uh, to be able to deal with being on stage or something and, you know, deal, you know, not having to worry about, you know, if a thousand eyeballs are looking at you, uh, if you do it enough, you get to a point where it's like, Oh, this is, you know, a boardrooms kind of piece of cake, slam dunk for me kind of thing. That's um, so true. And, right. And, uh, it, it, it's funny, you know, listening to your, your, your stories about sure that, um, sometimes it's like right in front of your face and you don't see it, <laughs> you know, and, uh, that, that can be, it's, and you do need, sometimes you need that outside that third person, the coach or something to kind of, you know, just give you a little nudge and help you see it a little bit better. Well said. Um, I'm curious, like, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, what about kind of starting kind of now your next phase of your career? Um, is there anything about having been in, cre in a creative uh, space for a long time that said now's the time and here's why I'm doing this? Yeah, that's a great insight, too. I I attribute this. There's, there's kind of a, a few lenses to this. I, I was very fortunate to grow up in a, in a family environment that a couple hundred years ago um, resulted in, in the foundation of a very successful family business. And I say that because I believe somewhere in my DNA, Michael, uh, there was a bit of a spark of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Fast forward many years in my corporate career, I, I got an MBA and, and one of my years of, of focus was entrepreneurship. And I came out of that experience saying, one day, I don't know what, one day I'm going to start my own thing. Day, right. It might be a coffee shop. It might be a lemonade stand. Who knows? Yeah. Fast forward a number of years when I decided to make this transition to leadership, that's when everything really came together mm -hmm. and I realized that 
for me, the ability to help support leaders on that on that people side, leveraging music, leveraging my experience in corporate America and putting all of that under my own kind of roof uh, was going to be that opportunity. And I've absolutely loved every minute. Uh, it's not that um, for, for those of your listeners that are entrepreneurs, you'll appreciate this. It's not that it's not uh, incredibly challenging. You know, running your own business, of course, is. For me, it was more about the nature of the challenge being incredibly fulfilling. Learn something new every day, uh, make an impact every day, and and really get to to learn, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering if you are willing to take on this kind of question, which is that, you know, you've been sort of called into this leadership uh, role in, in, in business. And I always think of leadership as an incredibly creative uh, field and, and pursuit. And I think a lot of people don't and think of it as more of a, a rote thing you go get an MBA for. And I, don't, I think that's like 2% of it. Um, and you're smiling, which I hope means you're kind of on the same page with that. So I'm curious, like if you combine all those things, what, what do you think is, what's the true crea- creativity of great leadership? I think, um, so it starts for me with kind of defining what, what do we mean by leadership? And I, there, there are a million books and a million podcasts and a million definitions on that. I, I guess I start with <clears throat> um, capital L leadership, meaning that it's, 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 a, it's a way of being, first and foremost. Um, for many of your leaders, uh, you may know this kind of uh, perspective that many of us were trained in, in what's called the doing side of leadership, mm-hmm. right. executing, solving, yeah. achieving. And that's important. What's often lost that I really enjoy talking with my leaders about is the being side your mm-hmm. values, your character, okay. your impact on other people, how you show up, uh, the impact and helping them grow. And within that, to answer your question, I think there's a huge creative aspect. It starts with identifying for yourself what kind of leader you want to be, um, composing, if you will, like like writing a song or a score, yeah. thinking more importantly, not about you, but that, the kind of impact that that leadership you want to have on others. And then, and then like a performer or a composer, if you will, think about how you want to bring that to the audience. And so I think uh, in terms of creative lens, th- there's a lot of lengths I see from the leadership perspective. I really like that. Um, and that idea of like, uh, you know, you're um, showing up as how you're being is really, uh, I-, I think that's really good insight. And I think for me, a lot of the creativity that's happening uh, that you see now is, um, you know, a, a realization that um, you can't lead the same way you know, in successive years, just because the, the world around us changes so quickly and you have to be, I think, I think you have to be ahead of the curve to stay, um, uh, to stay successful. Like and anything you, that worked five years ago doesn't by definition still work. I think you have to always be reexamining. Um, I know for me, like one of the, one of the things that, um, that, uh, the whole lockdown thing taught me, which surprised me was that, uh, I feel like the company and I had been really progressive on lots of, you know, how to, how to, how to be present for employees. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I was stuck on and didn't realize was that we had to be in an office together. And I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know that was something that needed to be examined. And as soon as like, oh, I think we probably need to, to be home. Like we need to do that like now. And I was like, oh wait, but isn't that going to ruin everything? It was like this little, you know, tiny guy on my shoulder kind of moment. And then we pretty quickly found out that now it actually kind of doesn't matter at all. And now we have a mostly empty office that in a way I'm actually thinking about remodeling to a, into a video podcast studio um, because, but, but it's funny, like you, but we had to adapt and I had to adapt and I had to, had to examine that belief and take a big old hammer and crush it. Um, I'm curious for you, like, what do you see for yourself and even the leaders that you're coaching? Like what's, what's changing in the landscape of leadership that maybe even some of your music training has been really effective for? Well, I think uh, that's another great question. I would I would say the the impact of COVID, uh, as you alluded to, has had a, a a massive and in many cases positive impact in a lot of areas. And and kind of making this link to music and creativity, I would say it's it's forced us to reexamine um, on a kind of a broader level how we want to lead, and then on a very practical level what that looks like, where we work, when we work how we work. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I, I immediately thought of kind of an improv jam, right? Musically, it's like you're playing in the key of C and somebody says, uh, let's try the key of, I don't know, F sharp minor. And, and like any good situation, there might be part of that brain that says, wait, that wasn't the plan. <laughs> right. and, and, and COVID was that shift, right? Yeah. And so I think it, it, it teaches us the opportunity to make some really creative adjustments and adapt and, and create new possibilities, something bigger and better in many ways. That's really good. Uh, it's funny. I, I don't know about you, but as a guitar player, I, I think F sharp's a really fun key. That's one of my. <laughs> it's a great. It's a great. <laughs> it's a great kind of a lane for rock, guitar, right? Yeah. Um, 
And I mean, that's a good like litmus test, right? Which, which keys do you like being in? Um, you know, so one of the questions I really like asking people is, um, you know, music and performance especially has a, a tendency to create stories of hysterical failures that maybe turned into a, a nugget of something that you learned. Um, I know like uh, one, one of the ones I, I was thinking about recently for me is um, uh, I remember being, um, we were touring and I kind of broke and, uh, you know, kind of living whatever they paid us that night to make it through the next day. And uh, I had a brand new piece of equipment and I was carrying it on stage and I lost my footing and f actually fell off the stage about whatever that would be three or four feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thought in my head was save the gear. And I, turned, <laughs> yes. All right. I turned so that I, I was like a half stack and it just like, crushed me. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, your priorities are so, you know, out of order here. Uh, but I'm curious, like, do you have any kind of hilarious, uh, you know, mishap stories that maybe you turned into some kind of life lesson thing? Um, I don't know that it's a life lesson, perhaps, but one of the funniest things that, oh, one of the many funny experiences we were, uh, this was about circa 1992. I was in an alternative rock band here in Chicago and we, we were playing in a, uh, a club that is rest its heart, uh, soul gone. Anyway, of all things, Michael, they, they had a set at 2 AM and 4 AM that we played. Um, we were, <laughs> we were finishing our two. It was a double door, was it? No. Um, uh, it, it was uh, around the corner from Double Door. Um, it'll the the name will come to me in a second. But we're finishing our set. This is so Spinal Tap, Michael. Yeah. We start sm smelling smoke. Oh my we're god! Like, Wait, I wonder what that is. Is somebody smoking in the audience? Well, it turned out the building was on fire. Oh my god! It was on fire. Wow! So we were quickly, <laughs> uh, we were quickly told to tear down our equipment, throw it in the back of the van, which we did quickly. And literally, you know, as we're pulling away, the fire trucks are coming. And the next morning, the entire building was gone. And we're convinced wow. that it was like some kind of insurance scam. But it was one of our wow. more colorful nights playing. That's pretty good. You know, it's funny. I don't know if this is going to be the club, but I have a funny story from something right around the corner, which is we played at a club. Was it Subterranean? Was that where you were? Oh, I, well, I, a different club. Okay. I played there as well. Yeah. But I remember I just had bought a new, really cool black leather jacket. And uh, I was like, oh, I, should, uh, I shouldn't take this in the club because someone might steal it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this in the car. And I came back after the show and someone had broken the window and stolen the jacket. <laughs> oh no, that's awful. I'm so sorry. So, but that was, oh, uh, you know, back in the day. Um, well, if you remember the name of that club, I'd love to know. Um, so maybe guess. kind of as a, as a, as a, maybe a, a, a final thought here. Um, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about dreamers, um, oh, by the way, dreamers with a Z. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Deep cut. Your your listeners uh, in the Chicago area will have to look that one up. I yeah, think it, back, it, it, back when the thing on the corner was a hot dog stand and not a bank. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, so so, so it's, it's kind of a final thought. I'd love to hear you talk about where where the where the kind of the future is, is going to take you, or at least you're heading for, and um, kind of where you think uh, you might take what you're doing with Odira. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would say kind of on a broad level, uh, continue our mission of helping leaders and amp teams amplify their leadership uh, in, a, in a truly authentic way. Um, we're uh, excited to kind of be continue to build out workshops worldwide. Um, and and then uh, we're also very excited. On, I'm going to be releasing a book at the end of the year using music as a lens for leadership, as well as a TED Talk uh, as well. So very excited kind of in the, in, in the coming months uh, for, wow. for all the things we have going on. And I thank our fans, if you will, and audience members for helping make that possible. That's so cool. And, and I, I think uh, a lot of what you're doing, I'm sort of looking at going, I might try that. I might try that. So you're, you're about a, 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 you know, 10, a, 10 footsteps ahead of me. I think I'm just sort of mimicking whatever you're doing. So thanks for that, that inspiration. Well, anything I can share. Yeah. Um, hey, this has been a real treat, real fun. Thanks for spending some time with me and, um, you know, good luck with everything and maybe have you again on uh, sometime soon. I'd love that. Thank you so much, Michael. Take care. The Leadership Superpowered Podcast is brought to you by Caxi Interactive, a custom software development company focused on helping mid-market companies achieve enterprise value through creating custom software that optimizes their business, creates huge leaps in customer experience, and widens their mode of differentiation in the market.